Collins. Mike Birbiglia is a comedian whose work has been featured on Netflix. He's an actor who's appeared in movies and on TV shows, on shows like Orange is the New Black, on HBO's Girls, and on Showtime's Billions. You may have heard him on WFAE on This American Life. Mike Birbiglia is the New York Times bestselling author of Sleepwalk With Me and other painfully true stories. And as that title indicates, he's also a storyteller who just happens to be telling stories on himself in his latest show, The New One. Fresh from its Broadway run, Charlotte is the second stop on the tour, and the show opened last night at the Night Theater for a week-long stop. But he's just getting started, because Mike Barbiglia joins us now to tell us more about the show and his life and more, and, and put up with this noise outside our window. Oh, thanks for having me, Mike. I'm enjoying this. You're, you're walking, I was going to say, you're walking, I said, <laughs> there is a lot of construction. That, that's a good sign for the city, though, right? I guess, I guess it is, yeah. <laughs> it's a good sign for t- people living 10 years from now. You do a... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do a lot of lot of different things. You write, you act, you direct movies, you're funny, you're a stand-up. But when you think of yourself at night, when oh. you're alone in that sleepy bag in the oh. hotel room, uh, <laughs> what, what do you think of yourself as? Oh, gosh. Um, I think that, um, well, you know, I, I write in all those media, and uh, but ultimately I, I think what I have to contribute is comedy. And and I, every if you look at like the movies I made, don't think twice, or Sleepwalk with Me. You look at the, the book or the shows. It's um, the the through line is that there are jokes, and there's comedy, and that ultimately there's a heart underneath it, yeah. and that there's a, there's an emo there's emotion to it, which is which is why I ended up working with Ira Glass, and you know because he and I have that in common. We you know he uh, he's. Um, Everything he does sort of has a heart underneath it. W- would you say that this is kind of like uh, a really extended, extended, extended version of uh, this American Life story piece? I I would say that, except <laughs> that I don't want to insult uh, the, our brilliant designers, Bay Wolf, Britt, and Aaron Kopp, and, and uh, lighting designers and set designers, and our director, Seth Barish, who painstakingly created what is a seemingly invisible set design, but is actually pretty involved. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and with a surprise built in. Yes. Um, tell people what this show, the new one, is about. I don't want to. I don't want to give anything away. So you tell them what it's about. Here's how I describe it. I always say like the first half of the show uh, is about how all the reasons why no one should ever have a child, and the second half of the show is about how I had a child. And and why I'm right, and then and then more interestingly, why I'm wrong, and then therein <laughs> lies the emotion of it is coming to grips with this idea of of change in your life, and uh, and for me the biggest change was I, I really genuinely you saw the show last night, I genuinely never wanted to have a child, I just did not think that it was something that that I that I needed to contribute, <laughs> that the world needed more of. <laughs> <laughs> and uh and uh and and but so that it was a it was a big life adjustment you st- you tell some story like that that's a story that oh. is so un-american yeah uh, it's so <laughs> <laughs> antithetical to who most people think of themselves as being sure. and to society at large that that's a pretty brave thing to admit to an audience full of people but that's not where you stop. You keep going. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I would not even say that's oh the brave part God. at all. <laughs> there are things that you tell about yourself that I wouldn't tell to anybody. Deeply uncomfortable. <laughs> there, there, there are stories in the show that I, I swear to this day, and I've performed the show at this point probably over, almost a thousand times. There are things that I'm on stage thinking to myself, I can't believe I'm telling this story. I can imagine. I'm thinking that as I'm saying it, I'm going, wait, how did I get myself into this? I'm telling this story? And you planned to tell it, and you you wrote it, and you rewrote it, and you rewrote it, and you rehearsed it with the director, and you still tell it. Well, I think that it's it's crucial because, (laughs) like, the thing that you and I are alluding to, and, and, and we don't want to give away a spoiler, but it's like, I think is what you're alluding to, is... Is is intended to show the audience that that I, I it's not the cynical attitude of just people are all terrible. It's like people are terrible and I'm terrible and we're all terrible. Why are we making more of these things? <laughs> and uh, and I feel like yeah, if you don't if you don't shine the light on yourself in that way, then it's uh, then it's it's a little bit disingenuous. I looked around last night uh, as as you were performing at the audience. And you know who really, really likes you? <laughs> you tell me. Women. 
Yeah, I had you know I had this. I'm signing after the show a poster, um, and people can come up and, and and get signed posters after the show tonight. Of um, my wife and I are writing a book version. Right. It's a it's a, a a a growing out of the show into a book it comes out in May. So we're um, people can pre order, and I'm signing posters. And this woman comes up to me, this middle aged woman with a grown up kids, and she goes. Uh, Thank you for writing a show about my pregnancy. Yeah, it makes me so happy when some when someone says that who has a very different experience than I have. I mean, you're admitting you're admitting the faults of all men in the world. True, <laughs> true. Yes, you're just the you're just the ten post. Yes, for that. sure. Yeah, <laughs> and and for some reason, I don't know why it is, they find that endearing because they've had to put up with it in their own lives. Yeah, it's interesting because it's. And you're coming clean. That's what the, well. That's what the development of the process of the play yielded. Like overdoing it to many different places. So, like for example, when I started out telling these stories about uh, my wife and I deciding we were going to have a child, and then my wife's pregnancy, immediately it connected with grown-ups, you know, adults, people who had children, and then I changed the show somewhat dramatically when I started performing it at colleges. Hey, this is an early version. I was like, oh, it's not connecting with them at all. Like, I, I performed at Princeton University once, and it was like, oh, you know, they're being polite laughing, but they're not connecting with this the way that people are who have uh, had this experience. They? Yeah. Right. They, they've never thought, you know, probably a lot of them never thought about having kids. Most of them don't have kids. And, uh, and so that's wherein I, I, I built out this metaphor in the show that you saw of the couch. That's where the couch came from. Yeah. So I talked for five minutes at the top of the show about my couch. Yeah. And people are kind of like, what? what? Why is he talking about his couch? But then ultimately, it's a metaphor for, you know, for life and change and, and things that we get used to. And, and, then, and then college kids came around. And now it's like, you know, 20-year-olds enjoy it and people who are 80 enjoy it. There is a set, yeah. as you allude to. There's lighting. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's a story. Uh, there's been a director involved in all oh, of yeah, this. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Therefore, it is, on some level, a play. Yeah. But it's more like stand-up. I mean, you even walk out. There's a stool center stage. Yeah. You walk out, you put your microphone on, you drop your mic pack down the back of your shirt, tuck it into your pants, and yeah. off we go to the races. Yeah, yeah. How does this differ from stand-up? Well, there's a narrative arc that's different. There's a, uh, it's, it's a, if you think about it, it's a single story from beginning to end. And... Um, and it's designed like a play by, you know, a Tony Award-winning uh, yeah. uh, set designer and uh, award-winning uh, director. And, uh, and, and it's the way I think about it. I mean, people disagree. About, <laughs> I do a thing that people disagree about. Some people go, no, you're not a stand-up. You're a playwright. And some people go, no, you're not a playwright. That's stand-up. And, and, and the truth is I don't really care because it's what I do. it's just what I do and the and the intent is not for it to be classified the intent is for people to laugh a lot and then uh for the show to sneak up on them you're a story in an emotional you're way. a storyteller and a lot of your work uh, that I've looked at over the years it seems to be uh, uh ba based on life experience I'm sure some of it's exaggerated but you're pi you're picking moments out of your life and you're yeah. and you're finding a way to make those moments some of which are would not be funny to most people yeah. you're, you're you're finding ways to make them funny yeah. humorous is this a catharsis for you? Are you? Is this like instead you have a couch in this show? Yeah. So is this like going to the couch? It is a little bit, yeah. <laughs> and and I, well, and more importantly, I think it's. I hope that it's that for the audience. I mean, my goal is that you reach a point where I'm opening up about things about my my deep feelings, and and that people have that sense of like, oh, I'm not alone in feeling. Yeah. Particularly with this show, it's like it's really about that first year of being a parent. And this feeling of like, oh no, is this what this is going to be like? Is the rest? Is this the rest of my life? This is horrible. <laughs> and, and 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 obviously, like, obviously that's not that's not everyone's experience. But that was my experience. And and clearly from the laughter, it's a few other people's experience too. People talk back to you in this show. Is that <laughs> last night they did? <laughs> is, this, is this a new uh, experience for you? You made it like it was a new, like it this was. is particular to Charlotte. I, I, I thought maybe it was, uh, or maybe because they were drinking. I don't know. There was a, yeah, there was a woman in the fourth row who, 
just kept talking and talking and talking. And, and to you? Yeah. She, well, she would say things like, you know, like I, I, I would say something and then she would, she, I would say like, you know, in, in a marriage, if you're lucky or in a relationship, if you're lucky, there are moments where you feel like your souls are connected in a way that two souls have never connected in the history of humankind. And you think, how did I get this lucky? And this lady just goes like, no. <laughs> oh, all right. Sure. And then I have to address it, you know, because it's yes. the perfect acoustics at the night theater. And so you have to say something. You can hear her as well as you can hear me. So, uh, so then, yeah, so then I stopped the show and yes. I yeah. talked to her a little bit. And then, but it's a, it's a real, uh, it's a high wire act when you talk to the audience because the show is inherently, it, it rides the line between being comedic and dramatic, yeah. comedic and dramatic. And so you, you actually have to keep people focused on what the story is. Yes. And you're scolding this woman at the same time. And that moment last night happened at a moment when it was about to get serious for a moment. Really. <laughs> introspective and mm -hmm. profound and you have this audience member making a comment that's idiosyncratic at this yeah, point yeah, yeah. and you play with her for a while masterfully oh I thanks i mean it was as though it was built into the show oh no it was i, I not. even thought well maybe this is a plant <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no that was a one that was one of a kind <laughs> Charlotte special. And, and let's keep it that way. Yeah, right? yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's really, I got to tell people that the acoustics in the night may be better than they are in the booth, but in the booth, you can't hear. You All you hear from the audience when they talk back to you is mm. like, it's like Charlie Brown's mother. Yes. That's it. That's yes. all you hear. Uh, I wanna, I'm curious about how this started for you because you were so many things. And I actually know you more from your work as an actor oh, yeah, sure. and from This American Life than I do as a stand-up or as somebody who tells a long-form story in a play format. I mean, I remember you as Taylor uh, Mason's love interest on Billions. Yeah, yeah. Taylor Mason is this sexually ambiguous character on mm -hmm. the show in a high-profile, she's brilliantly smart. Yeah. And you come in as a philanthropist, a rich philanthropist, and, you, and, and a gamer. Mm -hmm. And that's Oscar where. Oscar Langstreth. Yes, that's where you, the yeah. two of you connect. Yeah. Why you? Why did they pick you for this? This is an interesting thing for me. I think, I don't want to put words in the <laughs> creator's mouths, but, uh, but I think they wanted to have, because Taylor, Taylor's a gender non binary character, yeah. and. Um, is it something about you? <laughs> I think they wanted someone who was, who was boring. <laughs> I think they wanted someone who's sort of uninteresting and boring. And uh, no, but I'm just making that up. I, I, no, but I do think that they wanted some sense of like, you know, that the person that, that Taylor's care, that, that Taylor uh, is dating is not eccentric and not um, um, uh, uh, sort of what your brain would naturally go to and you're like, oh, that's who a gender non-binary person would date. They wanted it to be someone who, you know, I don't know what my character, what, you know, my character is uh, sort of like a run-of-the-mill tech guy. Yeah, he's, he's, like a, he's kind of like a bro or something. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. I don't know. I, I, was I, don't, know. I don't. I don't. I'm, I didn't create the show, so I don't want to tell to say too much on their behalf. So uh, it's clearly you're an actor. It's cl clear that you are a comedian. It's clear that you are a, a really fine writer because yeah. the show is really, really, really well written. Oh, thanks. Uh, uh, but how did it start? What was your goal at the beginning mm. when you were nobody? It's a good question. I don't know what the, I don't know how I ended up here um, in the studio. Right yeah, now. exactly. <laughs> that was construction. <laughs> I was just in town doing construction, and they said, "Do you want to do a show?" <laughs> the, uh, well, why not? Come no, I, 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 no, how I ended up here would be the uh, I, I wanted when I was in high school. I was in plays, and I was you know I was in uh, I was in Our Town. I was in Shakespeare's Love's Labor's Lost. And and then I started a sketch comedy group in high school. Oh, and yeah. Where, where was this? This is at St. Mark's School in South Broad, Massachusetts. Okay. And and then uh, and then I would write satire issues of the school newspaper, 
And then at a certain point, I was like, well, that's, this is what I want to do when I go to college. I applied to Harvard. to go. I tried to write for the Lampoon. I didn't get into Harvard. So I went to Georgetown. I said, is there a sketch comedy group? They said, no, but there's an improv group. I auditioned for that. And then um, those became my best friends. Like, I was really surrounded by that. And then I entered, like, the funniest person on campus contest, and I won. That was the first time I did stand-up. And then I started working at the Washington, D.C. Improv, which is, like, the equivalent of, like, the comedy zone here right. in D.C. And I worked the door for, like, three, four years, and I watched, like, the greats. I watched Chappelle, and I watched, you know, Mitch Hedberg and David Tell and, and Margaret Cho and all these great people, and I just learned from watching them. Wow. Do you have – what's next? Because you have a book coming out that's based yeah, on this show. Yeah, that's right. Your wife is a poet. Yep. That's right. And you, have, you incorporate just tiny little pieces of her poetry yes. in the show, that's right. more in the book. What's next after the book? Wow. Um, I, I have a couple movies banging around in my head. I, I directed uh, Sleepwalk With Me and Don't Think Twice. Don't Think Twice, I know you're just talking about <coughs> streaming services. Don't Think Twice is on American Netflix currently, if okay. people want to see it. It's a good one. It's about improv. It's about an improv group where everyone gets cast, where, where uh, someone's cast... In, on Saturday Night Live, and everyone else isn't. I have to stop. <laughs> <laughs> so Mike Birbiglia in the new one at the Night Theater through October the 13th. Thank you for being here. Thank you.